we are having this session cyber law like most of us most of the people who are watching today are from the security field probably like as far as i know and even if you are not in the security field like even if you are a layman or end user still there comes a time when you become a victim of some sort of crime like uh, let's say a family member or a friend becomes a victim of some sort of banking fraud or some sort of cyber stalking fraud or any any sort of cyber crime at that point of time when we go to the police station we have no idea like you know how exactly to approach the officer what information to give what documents to collect before going to the police station we need to understand all of it we need to have at least the basic idea about the law, legal part as well i mean even if you're from the security field like uh, for the security professionals like while testing the websites while testing the network or even if like uh, you, you go go to some company for some sort of consulting work what we do is you know uh, at times we tend to commit some sort of crime which we don't intend to but unintentionally it just happens because we don't because we don't understand what is the line which we do not need to cross while testing or while performing any sort of audit for any sort of company okay so here are a few things about me academically i just finished up my 12th grade i am currently pursuing my first year bsc id in sn college uh, which is in bhinder mumbai affiliated to mumbai university i am a security enthusiast a consultant speaker and a mentor for like a train men individuals groups different groups basically so uh, i've been a cyber security consultant for patna law associates consultant for mumbai and thane police wherein i was giving the technical guidance at the same time like wherever uh, they required my inputs in terms of legal as well as technical factor i've been an active member of anal of anal community which is a like a really really great community wherein like security professionals come and they they get to share they get to share their views they get to share their idea they get to share their experience in the security field so i've been a member of the nal community since a year and i've been an active member also like given a session like I've presented the news but and i'll be surely like uh, giving up, giving up more sessions in nal community on after the recovery and cyber lobby most probably i've conducted seminars and workshops in different educational groups like ngos corporates and i've also also trained individuals like i've created certain uh modules for end users basically what uh, like what happens is when we when you when you go and check about like different courses they are only for professionals but i've created some modules wherein like every individual have to understand to some extent that how these attacks are happening what are the principles behind these attacks so that a person can defend himself unless he knows from where the attack is coming what kind of attack is coming how that particular weapon works he won't be able to defend himself all he hear is don't click on links don't click on uh, don't don't download unknown files and stuff but if we understand that you know by clicking on that link what exactly happens in the back end he'll surely protect himself he'll surely prevent that because that'll be there in his mind forever because he know the consequences he knows the principle he knows the the way of attacking methods like mostly the attack which are done on individual level so uh, before you know going into the section we will we'll first discuss why exactly do we needed a specific law to handle these crimes or like cyber crimes like i'll be i'll be giving some stories i mean some case study basically so let's say if uh, i want to defame a person i want to defame xyz person and what what i'll do is like in earlier days a person used to make a pamphlet more for photo make a pamphlet and stick it on the roads on the walls the number of people who will see that particular pamphlet will be really less basically but when we talk about like current scenario it's 
very easy and quick because people can actually mock someone's photo and upload it on social media. The number of people who can watch it increases tremendously because uh, it is open to the public. Like anyone can, you know, just click on it, open it and see. So it's open to public. The, the amount of defamation increases to the next level. Now, uh, like, how do you think, like, would the normal conventional law would tackle this? Because they have a specific section, like, uh, which says that, you know, if someone is trying to defame someone, this is a section and this is a punishment. But now, the amount of defamation is increased. The effect of defamation is increased because it is accessible to more people, more number of people. So now it's not possible for the conventional law to decide and to figure out that, you know, uh, to what extent the defamation has occurred. For this, they got specific law, that is cyber law, like there are more cases which I cannot like mention everything here because uh, we have a limited time given to us. So we'll be straight away dive, diving into the sections basically. Now, starting with the first section, also, I won't be able to mention all the sections, so I'll be mentioning only the important sections uh, on which most of the cases are registered these days. Section 43A, which you can see is unauthorized access. So, what do you mean by unauthorized access? It can be technically like, you know, like uh, if someone is hacking into someone's computer, that too is unauthorized access. At the same time, if, uh, if someone is not available, like if, if his, uh, like the computer is lying down there, the laptop is lying down there, and the owner of that particular laptop is not present in that room, what I'll do is I'll just go and open it and see what confidential information are there, what confidential files are there. So just looking at the fact that I opened the laptop, pushed on the laptop, and I accessed it, doesn't matter, doesn't matter if there was no lock in that laptop. I opened it, it was unauthorized access because I didn't take the permission before opening that particular laptop. So uh, that too will be counted under this section, section 43A. So let's say if my friend left his phone here and I opened his phone, check all the files and stuff like that, or even if I didn't check it, I just took his phone, opened the lock and did something. I didn't, I didn't even like see any sort of, uh, you know, any sort of uh, critical information or confidential information, still this section would be applicable because that access was, was unauthorized. I, I didn't take the permission before doing it. Now, if someone is typing his password, if, he, if someone is logging to his, uh, like, log, logging into his bank account, and I'm just sitting behind that particular person, and I see him typing his password and username, I got to know what exactly his username and password, I have his credentials. Now, I can anyways, you know, just go and uh, access his bank account. So that too, like the stealing passwords in someone's computer or opening someone's computer to steal that particular password, all of it comes under Section 43A. Now there are there are certain terms which we'll be discussing right now. So instructing and communicating with. Instructing is basically giving orders. So let's say if I am putting up queries, I want to. I'm like, uh, let's say I'm I'm, I'm setting a network which is uh, the first example I've mentioned here, so I didn't actually come here because I had to discuss about these things. Instructing. So we're just giving an order. It's not a two-way process. It's a one-way process. We are giving orders, and we are not receiving any sort of output. But raising up queries, putting up queries to some computer or some network, that too is illegal because we don't have authority to do it. Authority to do it. In the same case, section 43A will be applicable. Coming to communicating with. So this becomes a two-way process. If I'm sending some queries, I'm getting some response. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to scan the ports, open ports in the like devices in the network, and I'm getting the output. That is communicating with, because it's, it's a two-way communication happening. I'm, I'm sending up requests, I'm getting the reply. Second, we'll come to access and secures access. So now let's say I have the credentials to some computer. Or if I open that computer, I put up the password, I, you know, like, uh, I access this, for a, this particular computer, I steal some information and stuff like that. So that, became, that, that becomes access. Now we'll talk about secures access. So let's say, like, we discussed about stealing password a few minutes ago. When I steal someone's password, if, I, if I'm able to see someone typing his password and I get to know about his password, I have secured the access. 
basically now it's possible for me to achieve the goal of getting the access anytime i want because i have the credentials it's really easy for me to get the access whenever i want so it's possible so that is the pure tactic we'll be talking this very basic example which happens in our day to day life which like uh, some of you might not be aware of basically like phys uh, physically damaging damaging a new laptop so like let's say my friend is standing right there in front of me and uh, she has a brand new laptop in which the operating system is still not installed so it's completely empty laptop like the hard disk there's, there's nothing on the hard disk i snatch the laptop i break it i damage the laptop physically in that case if this poor particular person goes and complains i'll have to pay the value of that particular laptop because there was no data in that right so i'll have to pay exactly like if it goes for 50000 i'll have to pay this 50000 baht but now the other scenario my friend is having a laptop which is old and there are a lot of data in that particular laptop so hard disk is having the operating system as, as well as a lot of files in it so that will be these files are confidential as well so now i do the same thing i snatch the laptop i break it when i break a laptop which is having a lot of data what happens here is i destroyed the laptop so the value of the laptop i have to pay but at the same time i destroyed his data as well so now probably have to pay the 10 times the value of the laptop or depending upon the confidentiality of the data which like decide the compensation has to pay coming to the second section section 43b which is unauthorized downloading copying or extraction this is this is something like really uh, rare basically like uh, when i talk about mp3 songs so like if i tell you that when you go and download your mp3 songs from mrjet.com or like there are a lot of websites to download mp3 songs when you download such songs do you take any sort of authorization from publisher or the music director any sort of authorization before downloading that you don't right so the authorities have complete right to arrest you like not not basically arrest you but from uh, take penalty from you based on the number of songs you are having because you are actually violating their copyright and stuff because uh, like you have not paid for listening to those songs or having them in your phone to download those songs you need to pay you are not paying anything and at the same time you are not taking any sort of authorization from the publisher or the music director which is very harmful i would say secondly is like if some sort of public informa information is publicly available and i download this download that or if there is a, there is some like online online module like a, a particular website or some life coach he provides some sort of online modules and i paid the amount i get the access to it but now when i when i do the registration process i'm clearly told in the the privacy policies that i'm not allowed to download that particular video i just have to access it online whenever i want to so i have the lifetime access to this particular module but i cannot download it i have to do it online your a lot of people what they do is they try to download it using different tricks tricks and methods which is again illegal so your section 43b will be applicable because it is a unauthorized downloading of data which you are not allowed to do now talk like talking about the copying of data so basically let's say like a very basic example my friend is having his laptop right there and he's not present his laptop is switched on and what i do is i just access his laptop to copy this confidential file or any file and i paste it in my laptop which again is illegal i mean he might be my friend but he can always go and lodge a complaint against me for copying the data from his laptop to my laptop without any authorization similarly uh, when you talk about the extraction so going to this uh, software debugging thing we'll we'll discuss certain things as in like uh, when we get a cd we have a lot of mp3 songs so we pay for that cd so let's say i paid 150 bucks for that particular cd which is having 50 mp3 songs now what i want to do is i want to have these songs in my phone which again is illegal because what i'll do is i'll try to extract these songs and convert their format and convert it into mp3 format and have it on my phone like save it in my phone basically but i'm not allowed to do that because 
when I download this song on my phone, I'll share it with a lot of people. They have not paid for it. I have not paid for having these songs in my phone. I have paid to buy this CD, listen to the song from the CD, not from the mobile phone. So that too can be counted as an illegal stuff and it will be like applicable. The section will be applicable. Section 43B will be applicable in this unauthorized swapping of data for songs. Now, most of us being in the security field, what we try to do is basically what we do is uh, we try to, you know, debug the software and we try to find the loopholes. It's completely legal. It's completely legal when uh, it is when you're authorized to do that. Like, let's say if you get the permission, like if there's some, some bug bounty program and it tells you this particular software is to be examined, you are completely free to debug that and, you know, uh, do the audit on that. But now, you're not allowed to test the software, but just you want, you just want to track that particular software and, you know, uh, use it for the lifetime without paying. You try to, you know, uh, decompile the software using a lot of, like, there are different tools, all debugger and stuff, to obtain the source code and manipulate and play with it, which again is illegal and uh, the session applicable will be strictly free for unauthorized extraction of data. So let us let us move to section 43C, computer virus, bomb, and contamination. So you talk about Kali Linux. We we have certain certain tools to spread viruses or keyloggers or Trojan virus like on a larger scale. We can just put up the database of uh, mail IDs and we can share. We can we can actually share the like we can spread malicious files and malicious links throughout just to the like the whole database, the number of mail IDs which is then in the database. Spreading of virus, spreading of Trojan virus, spreading of keyloggers are really and highly illegal. And there are like very severe punishment for the same. We often try to send phishing links as well. We try to manipulate the people. So that too is a malicious link. So that too comes under the session 43C. So we try to uh, like send a phishing link. For phishing, there, there are different sessions which are applicable. Are you talking about it like in the in the further, further slide? But you are actually sending some malicious content, malicious like malicious files or any sort of executable format, formatable file, uh, basically that which can harm the computer through some ways, which can actually affect the memory of the computer, which can actually interact with the computer, which can actually uh, perform some sort of uh, like you know uh, commands, which can uh, if you if you perform some exploit, there too you're using some codes which are being performed. So it is actually interacting with the computer, and that unauthorized interaction comes under this. 43C, wherein unauthorized interaction will be counted in 43A as well. Now talking about denial of service, like all of us must be aware of, aware of it. Deni denial of service, like DDoS on the website, DDoS in the network. In the, when the tech army was formed, a lot of DDoS attacks were done like on, on certain websites. But uh, basically, we are just thinking of DDoS as attack on network, attack on website, attack on devices, attack on mobile phones and stuff. But now, let's say if I'm working in an IT company and I'm the IT admin and I get to know that, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get paid for my work. I'm not going to get my salary and I'll be removed tomorrow or like something like that. What I'll do is I'll actually switch off the server or maybe like do some power cut some things to, you know, like avoid to prevent the people from using those devices, those uh, technologies for that particular day, which can harm the company to some while. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for this. So which can harm the company to some extent, which is, which is highly illegal. So denial of service is actually preventing someone to use some sort of services, any sort of services, any, it can be anything like uh, you talk about and if it is if it is on e media, they'll come under this section 43 F. Now talking about like we already discussed we already discussed about the websites and networks, but we'll, we'll discuss about bombing like SMS bombing and call bombing. So let's say in uh, banking fraud as well, this particular thing is being seen. Like I've seen a lot of cases where in uh, when the person is gonna get a message from the bank about the transaction, 
which will make him aware that you know in like some sort of fraud occurred and stuff like that what people do is they start sms bombing in the, on their number so when they get the messages from the bank along with that they get thousands of messages from different companies they start getting otps and stuff which confuses the victim to actually go and check the bank message and victim remains unaware of the fact that he went through a fraud and he, he, he was victimized for some sort of cyber crime and he needs to go and complain a lot of a lot of times the victim gets to know about it like when you go to the bank to update his passbook and stuff so uh, that is something which is being done and which is highly illegal section applicable to the same is uh, 43f now talking about section section 43g which says facilitate uh, like facilitating unauthorized access so let's say if someone is trying to hack into a company server and i'm working in the it team i'm handling the ids of the, the company what i'll do is if i want to support that particular culprit what i'll do as a as a you know supporter of the culprit i'll get the like i'll, I'll get the warnings from the ids like that uh, some attack is coming and from this particular ip address and stuff but i'll simply avoid that i won't take any action on the same which will like eventually help the attacker become successful in his attack because uh, there's no sort of like blocking of that ip address is done from the network network department which i am handling like i'm actually trying to help the culprit at the same time like if i if i want to help him like you know i i can give him the network diagrams of the company i can actually like i'll, I'll share critical passwords i'll share the credentials of the wifi networks and then he can easily get access to the networks very much makes it very easy for him to figure out which devices are vulnerable and how exactly he can get gain access to the devices and he can you know uh, become successful in his, in his attack at the same time like sometimes some people like switch off the firewall or like the same so these things will be applicable under section 43g which is facilitating unauthorized access okay now we discussed a lot of cases like uh, we discussed a lot of you know uh, sections in 43 and we discussed which are the case studies you know which makes it applicable which means the the whole thing applicable that you know this particular session will be applicable in this case this particular session will be applicable in this case we were able to figure out that because we were able to figure out that because uh, like we have this section section 66 which covers all the computer related offenses and it has all you know uh, which clearly states which punishment is given to which crime so all these are uh, like in uh, like when we talking about section 43 in, in as a, like as a together thing we get to know that it is all the offenses physical damage like virtual damage to any sort of computer resources or system done and it completely talks about that section 43 all the categories of section 43 revolves around damage to the computers to any like to some way now we'll discuss about the punishment given to the culprit if he is found you know like if he committed this crime if he gained some unauthorized access to some computer if he downloaded some unauthorized content if he if he contaminated someone's computer with some sort of virus worms or any any sort of malicious file if he damaged the computer physically or virtually like basically any sort of crime which we just discussed he'll be given the imprisonment up to 3 years and fine up to 5 lakhs so that'll be that'll be uh, basically the punishment given to the culprit who is committing this crime and it's not this like you know it's not a sure thing that he'll be getting the punishment of 3 years imprisonment up to 3 like uh, for 3 years it is up to 3 years so it can be anything from 0 to 3 it totally depends upon the level of damage which is done to the victim and uh, stuff now if someone is trying to attempt this particular attack so he is trying to do this attack he is trying to perform this attack and he wasn't successful in, in that he'll be given the imprisonment up to 18 months it can be anything between 1 to 18 months and fine up to 5 lakh rupees 
again, it depends upon the level of damage which is done to the victim. Punishment of abetment. Abetment basically is encouraging, a, which was uh, Section 43G basically, felicitating unauthorized access. But here we talk about everything, like all the crimes which are being committed in Section 43, encouraging someone or, you know, helping someone, supporting someone to perform that particular attack and be successful in that particular attack. This particular person will be given imprisonment up to three years and fine up to five lakh rupees. These offenses are available, but again, these are like highly punishable offenses. I will be talking about this, Section 66A, which is uh, like, I've, I've recently seen 10 cases based on this in the last one month. A very, very simple thing, like sending an offensive message. Basically, when we talk about the like, Section okay. Section 66A of Information Technology Act. So it is punish punishable offense for any person who's sending any sort of offensive message to the victim with the evil intention. It can be abusive, it can be gross, it can be cheap, like any, any sort of content which is sending through e-media, this section would, would be applicable. I'll just read out the whole thing. Like this is the official thing given in the in the books of cyber law for this particular section. Any information that is grossly offensive and has menacing character, or any information which he which the attacker knows false thing it is a false information but for just just for the purpose of causing some sort of annoyance inconvenience danger obstruction insult injury criminal indemnation enmity hatred or ill will persistently by making use of such computer resources for a communication device so, so if an attacker knows that the information which he's sharing is false but still he's trying to send it with all such motives which i like, just mentioned He'll be bought under the session. Any electronic mail and, or messages for the purpose of causing annoyance, inconvenience, or deceive or mislead addressee or re recipient about the origin of such message. So basically, any sort of mail also sent with such content, any sort of offensive content, it can be anything. If the, if, the, if it is affecting the victim through some ways, the victim can always go and lodge a complaint on this based on this session against the culprit. And then upon the court that what punishment would be given to him. The punishment given to the to the culprit is imprisonment up to three years. Talking about 66 B. There's another session which I just missed, so I didn't uh, add up a slide, and I, I would like to mention about that as well. There is 65 B, session 65 B. So basically, whenever an officer is investigating on, on some sort of case and he gets a media file. So basically, let's say like he gets a he gets a obscene video which is related to the case and which is the prime evidence. He needs to take the hash value of that particular particular media file or any file or zip file or or any sort of pen drive or CD is involved as the evidence. The hash value for the same is to be taken under the guidance of any expert or the person who is aware of taking a hash value, and then. A certificate from him, a 65B certificate from him, which clearly states that the hash value was taken on this date, this time. And now the report, like the hash value and the hash type is to be mentioned in the certificate by the by the person who's giving the certificate. And it should be submitted to the court. This is to maintain the integrity of the evidence. So basically, let's say uh, if uh, there's a media file, which is the prime evidence, so the hash value is taken. Hash value basically calculates the it calculates the dimensions and all the all the factors of the particular file and calculates like and gives us a value and converts it into hash and gives us a, give us a value. So the standard formats are MD5, SHA256 and stuff. Uh, now like these these are the type. Uh, okay. So these are, the, these are the information like which is really essential because you being from the security team, you can always give such certificates to the local police station. They always require such certificates from the from the person who are people who are aware of taking up hash values. It's a very simple process. So you guys you guys can actually like go for it and research on this.
that is to maintain the integrity so in when in the fourth session it is checked the hash value is taken again to verify if it matches with the hash value which was taken by the person who gave the certificate if it matches then only that'll be considered as a valid evidence so it's a really essential uh, like section i would say now uh, section 66b dishonestly receiving stolen computer so basically let's say uh, like my friend gets me a phone and he's like okay so this is a second hand phone why don't you purchase it the market price is 20000 i'll give it to you give it give it to you for 5000 i i might i might just uh, say yes to it i might just purchase this uh... okay so i might just like purchase that particular phone and you know use it for that particular computer or computer accessory hard disk ram anything if if it was a stolen property i'll be okay so now if i am aware that okay so this is a stolen property and my friend tells me that this is a stolen property and still i purchase that particular thing i can be booked under the section specific b the punishment for the same is imprisonment up to 3 years fine up to 1 lakh rupees punishment for the attempt so if i am trying to and i'm just like caught by the police or stuff like i have not purchased it but i was just like trying to do that and caught by the police imprisonment up to 18 months fine up to 1 lakh rupees punishment of abatement basically if i'm trying to encourage someone to do the same or supporting someone to do the same the same punishment as committing the crime imprisonment up to 3 years and fine up to 1 lakh i'm sorry in this uh, up to is not mentioned but it is up to 3 years not 3 years okay so the time we are having is really less so i cannot uh, talk on all the banking frauds which are happening but recent one like which i have encountered like there were around 25 to 30 cases registered under the police stations which i have been like associated with it is google pay fraud i mean it's, it's right like it's very uh, shocking to hear that like uh, frauds happen using google pay but yeah it's fact it's a fact basically i'll just i'll just uh, narrate a case study which i recently like uh, and with with his with the complainant permission i'm actually publishing it here the names are changed for privacy purposes So now Samir is a stationery shop owner. He deals with like selling up uh, stationery products. He suddenly receives an email on his stationery like email ID, and this email is from a person called Rahul. Rahul mentions that he is from a NGO, NGO X Y Z, which is a very known NGO in the city, and this particular NGO is working on the cause education. what they are trying is they are they are planning to purchase stationery products maybe worth 50000 baht and donate the same to underprivileged kids i'm sorry i'm sorry for the disturbance so donate it donate the same to underprivileged kids and he mentioned the whole thing in a very detailed manner in a very professional manner samir after checking this mail Uh, as a normal person would do he went and checked the website of that particular ngo as the ngo was very popular there was a website he checked the website and this in the team's list rahul's name is there rahul's photo is there but then sami cannot verify if it is the same rahul or not but then looking at his name the professionalism in the mail he believes that and he replies to the mail saying okay i'm, I'm i'll be glad to help in this i would i, I would uh, like i'm i'm willing to give you 50% discount as it was asked by the sender rahul the attacker basically samir agrees to give 50% discount in the whole purchase and he sends the price in the uh, reply in the mail the moment rahul gets a reply like samir has sent his number all the contact details where rahul can contact him rahul gives him a call and have a conversation with him about the transaction like about his cause and stuff like that and now rahul tells him that okay is it fine if i send someone from my team to collect these goods and you know the moment it is collected just let me know i'll make the online payment so samir mentioned that he can give his account number but then rahul insisted that he would like to make the payment from google pay google pay and rahul sorry samir the victim 
has, haven't used Google Pay much, but his account is there. His accounts are linked on Google Pay, but he's, he hasn't used it much. Like he has just done two, three transactions on Google Pay by now. Samir, without thinking twice, he just agrees to the same, and then Rahul sends the person to collect the goods. Person comes, collects the goods, went, like went back. Samir calls Rahul that, you know, the goods are collected. Can you please uh, make the payment? Rahul asks him that, give me your number, like the Google Pay number. Samir shares the number, like which is uh, like associated with his Google Pay account. And then Rahul tells him that I'll be sending the payment of, like the value was 25,000 because the discount of 50% was given to the attacker, basically. Now, Rahul sends a request instead of paying the amount, he sends a request of the amount which was to be paid. So you can see this in this slide. In the accused device, it clearly it clearly shows that you know a request of 500 rupees was made, which was not 500, it was 25,000 basically. A request of 25,000 was made, and you, as you can see, when the accused received the money of 7,000 from someone, from the same person, it says received. A note comes called received and the date, right? Rahul sends the request to Samir. So instead of paying the amount, he requests that particular amount. Samir gets this notification, a similar box, a bit different, as in the, the difference, the only difference is requested pay or decline option. Samir calls Rahul and says, like, uh, I get this button to click on pay. Why, why should I click on pay? Because I, I need to receive the money, right? Then Rahul mentions that, okay, uh, like, didn't you get the received note? Because it must be written, received, I send the money. You have to click on pay maybe to, you know, get the payment, like get the amount, receive the amount in your bank account. Samir being a noob at it, he clicks on pay, it asks for his UPI pin, he gives the UPI pin and the transaction is made. The moment the transaction is made, the accused, Rahul, starts SMS bombing. And now, Samir, instead of giving, getting 25,000, he gives out 25,000. The product of 50,000 is already gone, so the total loss right now is 75,000 loss. Now, accused, Rahul, started SMS bombing on his number. So the message which Samir received from the bank about the transaction that the amount is credited and I mean, the, the amount is deducted from his account, gets mixed up with these messages like he gets because of SMS bombing. He starts getting OTP messages and stuff, which actually prevents him looking at that particular message, which he received from the bank about the transaction. And then he completely neglects it because uh, he just saw this particular box, which he received that uh, it says paid and uh, he sees the box with a note received. So he thought like I received the payment and it must have like got, uh, got into my bank account. After five days, when he goes to the bank to update his passbook, he gets to know that there was no transaction where he received the money. Instead, he paid 25,000 to the person. Now, when he goes to the police station, they ask him, why didn't you come after 24 hours? Because you could have got the refund from the RBI, according to the RBI guidelines. If you come under 24, 24 hours, now the amount might get deducted even if you get the refund. So uh, RBI has a specific guidelines. So that is for the end users as well. Basically, like uh, normally, if you go through any sort of banking fraud, and if it is not your mistake, or even if it is your mistake, you know, uh, there are if it is your mis mistake, chances of getting the money back, chances of getting the refund is really less. I mean, 99% you won't get the refund, but then there are still some chances you might get it. So you you should immediately go to the police station complain it to your bank, get the acknowledgement that you went to the police station and the bank within the 24 hours of the transaction which was made. So that you have a complete proof that, you know, from your end, you complained to the uh, like concerned authority about the transaction which uh, was done by the fraudster or scamster. Now, uh, Rahul, like, uh, Samir gets to know about this whole scenario after five days. So, at the same time, it was his mistake that he clicked on pay to initiate the payment. He didn't get the like uh, he did, he didn't get the refund from the bank, but we were able to trace the accused through the Google Pay UPI IP logs. 
the geolocation from where like you used to make the transaction like from his this account you used to transfer the amount somewhere else so normally the, uh, the good feature about google pay is it actually tracks your location while you're making any sort of transaction so we were able to trace the accused within five days last, last. Okay. so uh talking about 66d cheating by poisonation so uh there's another section section 66c that is for cheating by identity theft identity theft is actually like you know taking up someone's passwords or credentials and using that for performing some sort of cheat using someone's digital signature using someone's digital signature to perform some sort of attack and uh perform some sort of cheating it can be banking fraud or any sort of fraud using some some someone's digital signature credentials username password and stuff now 66d is actually cheating by poisonation so it is mostly done on corporate corporate level like uh, proofing someone's identity which was again there in the this one the, the banking fraud case which we just mentioned the ngo's name which was mentioned the attacker was just trying to spoof his identity that he's from the particular ngo so this particular section was applicable from the it act section 66d because he was actually just you know trying to poisonate that he's from that particular ngo and just because he used the name which was publicly available on the website probably and he made a email id with that same name and probably that made rahul a bit emotional because it was for a cause and stuff like that so this cheating by poisonation actually happened from the punishment for the same is imprisonment up to 3 years and fine up to 1 lakh rupees punishment for the attempt if someone is trying to attempt it and he got caught in between imprisonment up to 18 months and fine up to 1 lakh rupees punishment for abetment if someone is trying to help someone so let's say uh, everything was clear this attacker got to know about the website the ngo's name and then he used the ngo's name the information which was publicly available on the website and he used, he used all those names and he made email id based on that he was aware that these ngo this particular ngo is uh, functioning and doing activity social activities on educational causes so he got all those information from the public but now a question arises that how how he was aware that samir is a noob at using google pay he got this information from someone right there must be a midman who gave out all this information so he can be booked if there is such a person he can be booked on the same session to fix the for a bad minute for providing all these details the punishment for the same is the same as committing the crime imprisonment up to 3 years and fine up to 1 lakh rupees again this offense is available Oh. violation of privacy is like uh, you know basically it can be anything recording some video playing up some photo and putting up online like i i i click your normal photo which you have not given me the authority to do that but then still i just click your photo i upload it online without your consent without your permission it's a very basic thing i mean yeah the severe things can be basically like when uh, someone is actually posting some obscene material some obscene media file which are confidential which are like highly secretive to a person and someone is trying to leak those from someone's phone by accessing someone's phone or recording that that can be a different level thing but now talking about the very basic thing talking about the very basic thing normally like you know uh, if i'm trying to violate your privacy like i'm just clicking your photo uploading it online that too can be applicable I mean, this session can be applicable in that as well. Section Section 66 for committing a crime up to three years, like imprisonment and fine up to two lakh rupees. Punishment for the attempt. If I'm trying to do that, like if I tried to post it and I wasn't able to, and the police caught me, maybe and or else like I made pamphlets or I try to share, like I just try to share these media files, make it viral, but I wasn't able to do it to the extent which I wanted to do. The attempt. was done so i'll be booked on the same session and the imprisonment up to 18 months and fine up to 2 lakh rupees if i try to encourage someone or support the culprit who's doing it 
suggest him ways, methods to do it, and you know, uh, to perform this particular thing. The same, same punishment if I committed the crime, up to three years of imprisonment and fine, up to two lakhs rupees. The last section we'll be talking about right now is cyber terrorism. So it's a, it's a very like a very sensitive thing. We need to understand this basically. You must be aware of this uh, recent tweet which happened with Team 07 like on TikTok. They made, they made some video which was actually offensive to some com communities, communities and they were like put under the same session. Because anything, anything which is promoting any sort of uh, like supporting to any sort of community, a group that the government functioning, it can affect the government functioning, it can affect communities functioning, like it's, uh, it's can affect the harmony and the peace amongst the community. Any act which is done to perform that will be put under this particular session, that is 66F, cyber terrorism. I'll just read it for you, read it out for you. Unauthorized access, etc. Like if I hack into someone's device to steal some information and publish it somewhere, and which is offensive to some community, some religion, some government parties, which can create huge impact on the society that will be counted under cyber terrorism if i hacked into some government's website i get out some very critical information and if i publish that it can actually affect the government's working it can affect the people who are working for the government agencies and stuff so that that too will be considered as cyber terrorism because we are actually trying to harm the government's property and we are trying the impact to it is really big. Punishment for the same is very crucial in this one. Imprisonment for committing this crime is life up to life imprisonment. It can be anything and the maximum is life imprisonment. Punishment for that time. If I tried to do it, let's say I posted something, it could not make that impact, but it was deleted, the post was deleted. Still, I can be both under the same session and the imprisonment up to 10 years can be given to me. Like, it can be anything between me to 10 years. Punishment for abetment, encouraging someone to do it or contributing towards the process of, you know, committing of this crime. The same, same punishment as it is given to the, the person who's committing the crime, life imprisonment, up to life imprisonment. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Also, I would like to like mention that uh, it's, it's, it was really like good talking to you guys. Now, I would like to request you, you all, to, you know, research about legal aspects because I was not able to mention and cover up all the topics in cyber law. It's very huge. I covered up very important, important aspects uh, which were which were like uh, really essential and which are like uh, which the cases I've seen like most of the time during the recent months. I've covered all of those, but now I would request you guys to research about this. What are the procedures when you go to a police station? Every end user should understand it. If you have to go to a police station, you need to understand what procedures are to be done. Uh, like you need to help the officer. You need to help the officer with all sorts of documents which are required. So you need to understand what documents you need to take if you become a victim of some sort of crime. You need to be like uh, stable enough to understand the whole scenario, research about things, learn things. Because along with the technical knowledge, legal knowledge is really important because uh, whenever we are testing for them, some websites or some network, there are times when we go and test the things which are out of scope. And for the same, the, the concerned company can take action against us. We need to, we need to be very careful about that. Thank you.